Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, so nice to see you all here today. So let me introduce this speaker today. Uh, it's Dr. John Harrington. He's an associate professor in molecular and cellular pharmacology at the uh, University of Oxford and also a tutorial fellow in medicine at the uh, Versace College, Oxford. So uh, his uh, research interest is, is on molecular mechanisms of reproduction and embryogenesis, uh, also genomics and proteomic approaches to understand the cell signaling. But on the top of that, he has a key interest towards this popular science and communication of science to public. In 2012, he was awarded a prestigious uh, media fellowship from British uh, Science Association, beating 170 applicants to become uh, one of 10 luckiest scientists uh, sent to media outlets such as BBC. Also, Dr. Barryman spent seven weeks, uh, seven weeks uh, with the Times of London and covered the ENCODE project, which indicated that the contrary to popular thought at this at the time, 80 to 100 uh, percent of genome was in fact functional. So uh, the the ensuring controversies of these findings inspired him to write the deeper genome, which explores what the genome is and how our understanding of it has changed over the years. So today in uh, Estonian City of Life Sciences, he is going to talk about science is weaker and communication science to public. Over to you, Dr. John. Brilliant, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Yeah, so it's a um, pleasure to be talking about science communication, which is uh, something that has very much interested me over the, over the last uh, decade, really. Uh, so I thought we should start uh, maybe worth giving a bit about my background because I think it kind of gives a sense of uh, why I'm particularly interested in the idea of communicating science uh, to, to all my people. Really. Uh, because I, I grew up in a place called Bradford, which is a place in Yorkshire in the north of uh, England. Actually, Ali knows this place because uh, this is uh, reminding me of some of the best Indian restaurants in Britain, but Bradford is interesting for a number of reasons. One is that it um, used to be at the centre of the textile industry in the world, but since then that industry has largely disappeared. Um, and so it's very, these days it's got all sorts of problems, it's a very positive. I went to a, a school that didn't generally send people to top universities, so it's quite a big uh, thing for me to then to apply to a university like, like Cambridge University. Um, which is where I did my degree. And I, I guess the only thing that that opened up for me, really, coming from a background for, for, for a underperforming school and a, a family who've never had a child that had gone to a university before, was it opened up all sorts of possibilities for me in my, in my life, my career, but, but also my life in general, really. Because obviously I've been exposed to some very beautiful uh, scenery. I'm in St. Bradford and Arizona, bits and pieces of their beauty. But, uh, but certainly you know, the college at Oxford, uh, Cambridge, quite um, uh, iconic. Uh, this is a picture of the backs, which is the river by, by the backs of the Cambridge Colleges and King's College Chapel, there, quite a, a famous building. But it was particularly in this um, type of point, but you can see the, the library there at the, um, uh, the left-hand side. That was the library in the zoology department, where I did quite a lot of my study in the final uh, year of my degree. And it was certainly um, inspiring to be sat there, um, given that in the, the yard below there was a space where uh, the original discoveries that led to the double helix structure of DNA were worked out. So to, to have that kind of experience and working with obviously some you know, high-tech labs and, 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 and on our practicals there was, was the big thing really. So I think that kind of showed to me exactly how change of environment and, and being opened up to the possibilities uh, of higher education it could, could open up all sorts of possibilities, certainly for me as an individual. And that continued really with my PhD and my postdoctoral career in London. So I did my PhD at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, and, and then I went on to do uh, independent fellowships at the National Institute for Medical Research and University College London. And it was at that time I first started to get an interest in writing about science for the public as a PhD student. So I can't remember now the, the publications I wrote, but kind of fairly small uh, independent publications. And, and it was trying to explain science to the public then that first 
I realized that it's a challenge both in the sense that um, trying to explain complex ideas to people who might not know much about science on the one hand, but also I guess it, I find it inspiring to try and explain uh, what, what, you know, what, what I was learning about science to, to other people. Um, and then I, following that, that those uh, postdoctoral fellowships, I then took the position at the University of Oxford where I've been ever since really. And that was to some extent quite surprised to find myself back in an Oxford environment, again with all the colleges and all the grandeur. Um, but at this time, I was also starting to become more interested, in, uh, you know, in, in developing my both my research career, but also popular science career. Uh, this is a bit about the, the work that I do in Oxford. I, I work at the medical uh, science division, um, very much, uh, you know, standard kind of me medicine course there. Um, so on the one hand, this has been very much a career built around uh, standard teaching career. Um, doing lectures, seminars, practicals, doing my own research, trying to push that forward. But, um, and this is the Department of Pharmacology where I work, where, where uh, my work has been continuing for the last uh, couple of decades. But one thing that's also interesting about the Oxford College system, um, so this is common for both Cambridge and Oxford, is that a lot of the, the teaching, particularly the tutorial teaching, is done in the Oxford Colleges. and. And there's also an interest in, in, in a way in colleges in developing links with the public that you might not get in the as much in the departments. So this is the medical science uh, teaching uh, syllabus that, that I take part in. And obviously that what you can see from looking at this, I mean, I teach particularly the molecular and biochemical aspects, is that there's a fairly limited uh, potential there for bringing in science society in a sort of broader sense. So although I deliberately try and do my best to um, you know, bringing some of the, the social and political aspects of, of, of the subject. So, for instance, when I teach about uh, the press cycle, obviously it's a kind of key part of biochemistry, I talk a bit about the fact that Hans Krebs actually had to flee the Nazi Germany to be the Jew and, and some of the kind of political aspects of that. But in general, it's very kind of hardcore molecular biology and biochemistry that I teach. And, and, and that's obviously true of my own research, which is very much molecular focus. Uh, in, in this particular case, looking at the molecular mechanisms of calcium signaling. So you might then ask, well, how is this kind of all then gelled with, with an interest in, in popularizing science to the public? Um, and in this case, I thought it was worth going through some of the ways in which I first started to become interested in um, popularizing science to the public. And so one of the things actually came from having um, children growing up in the, in the state education system. In, um, in, in Oxford, because we were asked as, as scientists to, if we wanted to come and give a presentation to students at the, uh, the school. So this is year six students that we end up working with. So that's 10 to 11 year old children. Um, and we thought, well, we, so this is, my wife has also kind of worked in a fairly similar area with me uh, of, of calcium signaling. So we thought, well, how can we kind of make the science interesting? And, and one of the things that we did was, as well as me giving a, a presentation about uh, DNA and, and, and uh, reproduction and, uh, and sex, which are kind of subject areas that I've specialised in in the past, um, we thought it'd be interesting to do experiments. So, for instance, we brought in that CO2 sperm, we fertilised these at the microscope. We, um, we froze objects, talked about IVF, uh, freezing embryos in, in the ART industry. We also, uh, the kids were, were extracting, um, this is my, my class, by the way, it's just a thing on the internet, but um, pretty similar kind of age, uh, kids really. And, um, and the other thing we did was to let the children extract DNA from strawberries and, and, and then take off a sample of DNA with them. So, so I think that really just kind of showed to me how interesting it can be to try and bring in your know, experience as scientists into the classroom. Uh, in a way that kind of brings the science alive. And it was actually one of the children in the class that said, you know, science is wicked, wicked in, in, in this case being a, a slang word. I'm not sure if they use it this way anymore. This was a language changes, so that's but in this case meaning, you know, this is exciting and that kind of thing. And one thing I have uh, then found actually working with children in, in, in these uh, fashion situations is, you know, how much the practical aspects of things can make the science come alive, even to students that, you know, may not be that interested in science. Um, now, interesting that that also then went side by side with some of the work that my colleague, Worcester College in Oxford, was starting to do with uh, with schools. So it's a thing that Oxford 
colleges, but as part of a way to try and make Oxbridge, which is often seen as a very elitist kind of system, as a way of trying to make it more accessible to, to uh, as many people as possible in terms of applications. Each college tends to work with a particular area of the country to try and interest state school children in, in applying. And coincidentally, uh, this was nothing to do with the fact that I, I actually came from Bradford, but coincidentally, my college happened to be working with the Bradford, uh, West Yorkshire area. Uh, and so, you know, we've done quite a lot there in terms of going up to Bradford, kind of all came to a bit of a granny call with the pandemic, but going up to Bradford and I uh, gave a talk, for instance, in Bradford and had uh, a workshop where the children were asked to think about um, the subject of gene editing, one of the subjects I work on. And, and come up with arguments for and against uh, the, the use of society. Um, and, and this, you know, uh, again, showed me how if you make a topic uh, interesting, stimulating enough, you can get all sorts of interesting kind of points of view from the students. And this has actually gone side by side with all sorts of other work I've done with other organizations, uh, which I'm not going to mention much today, but for instance, the Wellman Trust and, and, and uh, the British Council. Uh, using uh, top, to doing workshops and, and, and all sorts of different activities to try and get uh, school students interested in, in science. And one of the things I've often noticed is that often uh, students that have been kind of written off by the teachers as being not interested in learning and that kind of thing, in certain circumstances, I, I found them incredibly interested. So I think you also shows that you can never kind of assume that even the teachers know exactly it's ones who are going to be more stimulated if you give them the right environment. I mean, said that, obviously, it's a, it's a huge challenge and a tremendous work that you know, teachers do um, in terms of engaging their students. But I think it showed that scientists would go, you know, reaching out to the community, going to talk to schools, can, can have a very valuable role to play, and that we, we supply a slightly different kind of point of view. Now, in terms of a more kind of more formal um, step then into science communication as a sort of parallel career, I think really, as, as uh, you know, as, as you said in the introduction, um, one thing that really started to change is, I think, was in my mind, in, in the sort of potential what I thought I could achieve in this area, came from this uh, British Science Association Media Fellowship um, that, that I, I was successful in, in getting. I'd already had some dealings with the British Science Association. It's a, it's a body that's been around for, I think, over 150 years. I mean, Darwin was a member of it, uh, so it's, it's a long history. And it runs this festival every year, the Science Festival. And I'd, I'd given a talk there, and I'd also have been uh, given a prize award lecture uh, on, on, on fertilization and reproduction. So I had some kind of dealings with it. So when I saw these media fellowships advertised, I thought that was maybe something worth applying for. So these are things that are advertised every year. And it, basically anyone from PhD student to, to you know, senior head of a lab can apply for these. And um, you then go and work in some branch of the media as a, as a, as a journalist, a science journalist for, for a period of time. Anything from, uh, I think it's about three to six weeks. I think I did the maximum. I think I was there for about seven weeks in the end. Um, now you can go and work for the BBC, you can go and work for you know, radio uh, journalism, but in my case, I ended up uh, working for the Times newspaper. And, and that reflected the fact that I was already developing an interest in writing and science with other. Um, and that was a really exciting kind of period, really. I mean, it's a big thing as a, as a senior scientist, you know, to go on and leave your lab and, and go and do this kind of thing. I, I did it in the summer of 2012, and it meant going to, to live in London. I, I you know, stayed with a friend and his family for, for, for that period. Um, and I think, I think I was there about three days a week, basically. So coming back to see my family at the kind of end of the week um, and, and kind of keep an eye on what was going on in my lab. But um, it was quite a big thing, though, to sort of go and do that work, semi, semi full time, really. Um, but it was a really exciting experience because I ended up writing uh, 22 uh, articles for the Times in the end. And it's a very kind of different dynamic to. Um, to, to a science victory in the sense that, you know, where it might have been the years to put together the, the, the data for a paper or, or a grant application. Uh, in this case, it was very much a kind of daily thing where you get the press releases from, from the different uh, universities around the world. Um, and then you expect it to put together some kind of, you know, new story within in a space of a few hours and then pitch that to the editor, uh, get, try and get that published. And, and then, you know, hopefully you'll then see that in print uh, the next day. Um, and then you start all over again. So it's a very much a different kind of cycle compared to our kind of uh, life. 
And I found it very exciting, the fact that it was very immediate that you, you know, you'd say you work in, in print within the next day or so. Um, but also the, the, the range of subjects I was expected to cover. So it could be everything, I think I, my articles were range from everything from, you know, stuff I knew more about, like the genome to um, uh, why your chocolates are eaten to, so is there a super volcano under, under the Bay of Naples, that kind of thing. And it was interesting to to, um, to have that, to supply that kind of range of, uh, uh, of, of writing. And I think it also taught me that sometimes when you, you're expected to just produce that kind of text uh, in a job like that, there's no kind of, you know, thinking, oh, I'll leave it till tomorrow or next week, whatever. You've got to just get there and, and start writing, really. And I often found getting the first line of, of the article right was, was somehow the rest just seemed to flow with really. it. Um, and, um, and, and I thought that, so it taught me a lot about sort of journalistic skills, but also I, I realized I had a reasonable kind of skill for this. I was told at the end of the fellowship that, uh, you know, if I wanted a job at the time, I could probably quite easily uh, go on. But I did, I'd already made you know, a decision at that point that I was actually very keen to carry on my scientific degree. I wasn't going to jump into journalism. But, but it came in, I guess it showed me the possibilities of a different kind of uh, career. And, and I think that was interesting in itself, because what was interesting, what was, was said really uh, by the host uh, earlier on was that writing a specific article about the ENCODE project, which is a follow up to the Human Genome Project for the Times got me into this topic and I thought, well, maybe there's a, there's a book here. Um, I remember coming out of that experience of working for the Times of seeing if there was any way I could carry on doing some of the journalism, you know, maybe writing news articles, maybe writing um, um, uh, review articles for newspapers, as well as maintaining my position as, as a research scientist. And it, I just realised that it's impossible to really combine those two things, but both but, but seeing the possibility. And that's what led to then to me publishing my first book, The Deeper Genome, which was published with Oxford University Press. Uh, and it's all about the kind of complexity of the genome. And that then led to a subsequent book for you, The uh, Redesign Life, which is about the uh, gene editing revolution. Completely moved really to a subject that I'm not, you know, a, an expert in the sense that it's something I do in my everyday research, but a subject that I've had an interest in for many years which is human consciousness. And, and so I wrote this book, Mind uh, about human consciousness. And then I have a new book coming out in October called Consciousness, which is in many ways a, a shorter book than Mind Shift. Mind Shift's quite a big book, really, but, but Consciousness is only 50,000 words. And, uh, but it's very similar themes and also engages with some of the arguments that we get about the nature of consciousness in uh, history and philosophy of science. Um, so you could argue that there's been a sort of a reasonably successful career development there on the side of my research work, producing these, these books. Uh, and that's then led to other, other kind of aspects of uh, science communication that I thought we were talking about. Um, so for instance, you know, giving talks to uh, schools, I've already mentioned the fact that I've spoken in, in uh, primary schools. Uh, the top left here, this is a lecture that I gave to those students I mentioned earlier on at Bradford. Uh, this is in, uh, in, in a lecture uh, with organised my college in Bradford, but all sorts of other things. And I, I, I would encourage people, I don't know what the facilities are like here and the possibilities here in, in Estonia, but certainly in Britain, there's a whole range of, of forums for, for giving popular science talks. Uh, Cafe Scientifique, it's a Europe wide um, network where you can give a talk in a fairly informal setting. They have snacks and drinks and that kind of thing. Um, and they encourage scientists to come and talk about their work to, to work to a general audience. Pints of Science, pretty similar idea in taking place in pubs. Um, and then to more kind of formal uh, events, more kind of high profile events. So I've spoken of the here and why Literary Festival is quite a famous literary. The Oxford Literary Festival, the Brains British Science Festival, and of course the the the, the audience that you get at these different places, and the uh, the kind of uh, the size of the audience, the 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 the, the kind of knowledge that's there can be quite different, really. But I've found that in these very different forums, uh, there's all sorts of potential to really engage with the audience, and I think that's one thing that is really quite exciting about giving talks. I mean, it's primarily being talks about. The themes in my books, but you get a kind of feedback there that you're not going to get really by just sitting there in your office, you know, writing a book and hoping that people are going to read it. Um, and I'm always in, in, in really enthused and, and astounded really by the kind of the, the level of, uh, of the debate and the kind of uh, the interest that the people show and also their knowledge really. So I'm 
basically giving this kind of range of different formats that, that are available there. Just an encouragement to, to encourage anybody who's thinking about, you know, doing more popular science. Uh, but there's a whole kind of range of, of different places you can do this. Uh, and hopefully there's, there's all these possibilities uh, in Estonia and, and, and more generally in, in European countries that you may have, have access to. Um, and I found that doing this, these kind of talks in a kind of range of different circumstances is a good way of starting to build confidence and, uh, and, and also your kind of scope really as, as a... As a as a, as a popularized science. Um, something that's really quite new, and it, and it kind of shows how one thing can lead to another, um, was I took part uh, earlier this year in a TV documentary. So I've never done any TV work before. Um, so this is, um, was it, wasn't it been my first choice of TV documentary, actually? It was a, a three-part series on Amazon that's um, all about a serial killer, a British serial killer called Ian Brady. I don't know if people have heard it. If you haven't, then I've not missed anything in the sense that it's a horrible story. It was a person in the 1960s who, together with his lover, Myra Hindley, uh, tortured and murdered the children and, and uh, became quite a, a big a shocking case in, in Britain. Um, and, and so I was asked to give, uh, to take part in a documentary about this serial killer, um, partly because I'd written a chapter in my book, Mind Shift, about um, criminal psychopaths and, and their minds and trying to speculate really about what might be different about the, the brain of a, of, a, of, a, of a criminal psychopath. And from that, I was then invited to, to give this, to step back and make sure this is a shock from the series. I, I kept thinking I look a bit shell-shocked there, maybe it's because I've been talking about this horrible kind of murder uh, for too long and that thing. But, but I actually found it really interesting. It was, uh, it was based on me sitting in my college room with a camera on me. I think there was a camera coming from two different cameras coming from different directions. And being asked by the producer of the TV series, um, all sorts of questions about what I thought about Brady and his lines and, and his brain and that kind of thing. And, and um, very, very interesting in the sense I never really had the opportunity to really just talk to the camera for, for a whole day, essentially. Slightly worried then after the thing was, you know, all, all finished, the filming was finished, and thinking, well, how am I going to come over? Did I say anything that maybe I wish I'd not said? And, and I think that's one thing you do have to think about if you're going to take a part in it. Well, any kind of you know, documentary filmmaking or talking to the camera in terms of news uh, stories. Of course, what you say, to some extent, you, you let go of that. And it's a bit like, I guess that's also true in a way when you give quotes to the media. I know some scientists I've spoken to are very wary about talking to the media. They'd be definitely uh, wary about taking part in a TV documentary because of the way you might be misrepresented and that kind of thing. Um, one thing I would say about this, I think it comes to two directions. I don't think in general journalists are trying to trick us and make us say things we didn't mean to say and make sure of sentence, but of course, what they are trying to do is to make an entertaining, kind of exciting story. And, and so that can then lead to kind of blurring um, some of the. Well, I'll come back to that point a bit later on, actually, about news values versus uh, science values. Um, in the end, I mean, you really this kind of thing, you can see yourself what you think of the finished product. But I thought it was a really good production, and thank God I didn't come over and say anything that I would have regretted. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely true that to some extent, when you take part in this kind of exercise, so you kind of let go of the part of yourself, and, uh, and, and you've got to be prepared to do that if you want to take part in these things. Um, completely new venture that, that I guess some of this has led me into, but also showing um, the ways in which chance conversations can lead. To, to other things, um, is I recently signed uh, contracts to write a series of academic primings. And it actually be interesting to know people's point of view on this because, of course, as an academic, I, I recommend you know textbooks to my students to read and things. But um, I got talking to a publisher at an event uh, I was, I was uh, speaking at recently, um, and he um, said he was very interested in producing a series of primings, called, not big textbooks, but primings of only. 50,000 words on a series of subjects. And I guess because I'm so used now to writing the popular science, I thought, well, I never really thought about writing a, a, a textbook. But the idea of short primer seemed to me to be something I could I could do very easily. So at the moment, I'm just in the process of, of, of starting to write one of these, uh, which will be about genetics. There'll be another one about the mind and consciousness, and then a final one about biology. Um, and it kind of intrigued me what it was saying. He claimed that he thought there was less and less kind of a, of a market these days for huge textbooks. I don't know if this reflects, you know, students who just don't really want to read huge books anymore, whatever the rest of it. But, uh, but 
But I thought it was interesting. And, and, and in a way, obviously, an academic book, even if it's aimed at undergraduates, is really quite different from a popular science book. So although I'm using pretty similar skills in the writing there, um, it's obviously going to be quite a different book. There'll be a lot more diagrams. It'll have to be much more linked to the syllabus, that kind of thing. But it's a new venture, and in a way, it's something I maybe wouldn't have thought about doing if I'd not already had this experience writing. And I think it's true that the more you write, it becomes the thing that you do every day, and then it becomes um, actually a lot easier for anyway. In fact, one of my biggest problems is in terms of work, how I you know, delineate my time is that I actually find it easier these days to write popular science and this kind of thing than you know, grants and papers, which as part of my job, and I need to write these things, is, is obviously something I need to kind of I need to kind of come out of time. But it's certainly true that the more you do a thing, whether it's giving talks or, or, or writing books, it becomes, it just makes it easier. Um, social media as a platform, well, one thing that you always encourage to do when you write, you know, for OUP and that kind of thing, is to try and use social media to publicize your work and, and that so on and so forth. And of course, I mean, I'm on Twitter and I you know, use Facebook and, and other platforms. I have to say, I, I don't really get social media in the sense of, I think my children, for instance, get it in the sense of just have the, the number of different ways you can use it. So to some extent, I find Twitter a bit of a distraction, really. There's only a limited number of ways you can kind of spend your time. But I think there's all sorts of ways, particularly for the younger generation, in using all sorts of social media platforms um, to, to popularise science for the public. So certainly in the future, who knows, maybe there'll be more possibilities to, you know, use these platforms to develop, to reach out to a bigger audience. And that's, in a way, quite a... An issue for me at the moment really, is how to build a bigger audience because ultimately, and it goes back to what I said earlier on about me as a you know child going to Bradford, you know parents that have not been to university. How was it that I got interested in the idea of really pushing myself to, to apply to a place like Cambridge? I suspect it was things I read. You know, my school wasn't really a place where you got that kind of stimulation. Um, maybe things I read in the media, that kind of thing. So it's certainly, I'd love to be able to sort of reach out to people that might not otherwise be. Uh, thinking about uh, kind of an academic career or, or, or interest in science. Um, literary agents, I thought it was worth throwing this in because I do now have a literary agent. Um, and that was part of a, an attempt to try and broaden my kind of writing to a much bigger audience, really. Uh, OUP have been useful to work for, but, but actually the, the, the most recent book, Icon Books, the more commercial publisher, I mean, obviously, OUP are a very commercial publisher in the sense they make huge amounts of money every year, but they do have a certain style that's probably more academic. So I, I've certainly shown interest recently in the, in the idea of trying to broaden the kind of writing I'm doing in, in the audience that, 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 uh, that it's going to reach. It's always a bit of a tension, I feel, because, because I, I'd like to think that the books I've written, uh, although they're for a popular audience, have broken new ground in terms of the ideas that are there about the genome, about consciousness. And there's always the, the tension there that if you want to reach out to the broadest possible audience, you may end up diluting that kind of more original kind of message. And not, not to say that it's easy to write, to write a million bestseller. I mean, there is a, obviously a real skill to this, a real skill that I don't think I have in terms of the kind of writing. But I do think there's a kind of and, and I'll come back and talk about this, this sort of different levels of reaching out to the public. And, and certainly, you know, one of the reasons for kind of getting a literary agent, this is my agent, Johnson, I'll put that's Michael Johnson, who's the head of that. Uh, and, and I have to say, you know, he comes and talks to me quite regularly. I, I pitch ideas for books to him and that kind of thing. This is his offices and his son has a house in, in London. Um, and he's certainly been very useful. It hasn't like, led to any, you know, deals at the moment, but it's certainly... Um, I think useful to have that kind of feedback. And, and it's certainly true, I think, that the more you get into commercial publishing, it's actually quite difficult to get to, you know, talk to publishers unless you've got that kind of agent. Having said that, they get their, I don't know what it is, 15%, 20%, you know, so they get their kind of, they get their money best for doing this. Um, but it's something that I never would have even thought about with a literary agent until recently. But the more that you start to develop a kind of a, Really in this area, the more you're forced to think then about how you, how you do this. And, and, and it's, in, it's obviously useful in the sense that if you want to kind of media deal, whether it's doing a TV documentary or having your books translated into Japanese or Chinese or, or whatever, the agents kind of their use in that sense. I mean, certainly the agency was useful in advising me what kind of fee to ask for the, uh, for the documentary. I mean, they, I didn't have a clue actually what was the standard fee for these things. But, you know, there is there are fees and you need to know that. 
I wanted to sort of end really with some more general points, really. Um, and that's, I think, the point that if you are interested in popularizing your work for the public, then there's a really there are diverse audiences out there. And I think it's worth being aware that the kind of work that you do and the way that maybe you want to pitch things and develop a career in this area, you need to be aware that you know that there are these diverse audiences. So on the one hand, there, there really are people out there who have a huge interest in science. They know lots about science and, and, and they will they're the kind of people I guess that fuel the um the popular science book industry. Um, it's a bit of a problem, actually. There's a huge amount of books out there that saturate the market, you could argue that. So, so obviously, if you want to make a mark in that in that, um, in that that market, you've got to think what can make me distinctive, what can make me original. And you've also got to you know, think then about the kind of audience you write for. And that was obviously having an impact on the kind of work that you do. And it's rich, and, and, and obviously the kind of money that you might potentially make from it. It's also been aware of just how you know sophisticated some of the people out there are as an audience. When you give talks, I've, I've been interested in some ways when I've given talks you know, about a variety of subjects, how knowledgeable some of the audience are, actually. Um, having said that, my real interest, I think, in, 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 uh, in the future is trying to find ways to reach out to a much broader audience of people, really. And, and I think that's the challenge because... As you can see here, there's a whole series of people that you know might have an interest in science, but but um, um, a bit of a fairly passive about the way they approach that. They might maybe read things in the media, but they're not going to reach out to read a popular science book. Then, of course, you've got a whole series of people who are just disengaged from, from science, despite the fact that you know, science is integral to thinking about you know the key problems of the day, isn't it? whether it's global warming or or, 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 or pollution or you know the pandemic or any of these things. And it would be lovely to think about ways in which one could sort of reach out to an audience that normally just not be switched off from audience. Um, and maybe that's where one's got to be creative. And maybe this is where, you know, people from the sort of younger generation than me might be able to think of obvious ways in which, um, you know, social media might be used, TikTok, whatever, you know, might be used to try and engage with that kind of audience. Um, I mean, I think I've realised that my kind of forte is, is writing, but but then I've even done the TV documentary. Actually, I thought I could, I could be more of stuff really, you know, I could, I could enjoy this. So I think it's always worth being um, thinking about what might be the next step and, and also what might be your possibilities that you've never even, you know, dreamed that you'd be, so you'd be good at. Um, now, that also then brings us on to the, the question of how one combines all this with... Uh, a scientific career, and, and certainly for me, that's been a tension, I think, in the recent decades, really. Um, well, the decades since I worked at the Times, really. But it's actually, I, I have done various courses and things within to help kind of boost my, when I, when I say I just, you know, found I could write articles and stuff, that's not completely true that it was, it was as, as, um, uh, as simple as that. I, I did a, a diploma, a two-year diploma in science communication, uh, Burbank College, I did a, a, a diploma in creative writing when I got to Oxford. And this was all done when I was winning my lab and, you know, having a family and, and all the rest of it. So it was quite a, quite a challenge to sort of do all that. There are, though, you know, these part-time courses that, that make that possible. Um, and one thing I noticed, a lot of the people that did the science communication course with me, they were nearly all scientists who were kind of, I think, seeking to leave science. They, they'd realised they liked the communication, but they were really seeing it more as a kind of career as opposed to carrying on scientific research. And, and so I, in a way, I've always thought it would be great to, I mean, certainly I've enjoyed the kind of tension, the challenge really of, of combining my scientific career with writing popular science. But it is a challenge. There's no doubt at all that, you know, if you decide to devote your time to giving talks and writing books, and it takes time out, it does have probably an impact on the kind of research you're doing, the sense of the time that's left over for that. Um, and I think also it made me think a bit more about what kind of role that I play as a scientist in this process, because the course is shown here. We can think of it as simple as, you know, there's a science on the one hand, you've got your university press offices here, you've got your journalists, and somehow these are all distinctive roles. But as I've already mentioned, I worked as a journalist, even if it was just for a kind of brief period. You could argue that my science, my popular science book, to some extent, a kind of a, a form of not so much journalism, but certainly kind of comment on science, and and it's also made me more aware of the kind of the 
the, 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 the complexity of it. If someone writes about science and science, is that is that more valid than someone who does it just as a you know as a as a career? Because of course there are lots of people who professionally don't quite know how to do it. Some of these people in terms of what kind of money they make, but but who write they just write popular science books for a living, or they do you know uh, broadcasting for a living. Um, and, and certainly, I would encourage people who are, you know, in science, you know, working in science, who are interested in science communication, to certainly take seriously the possibility that you can combine the things. It's, it's a challenge, but it's, I think it's, it's good in the sense that I think there's something that working in science and in the academic community and where it gives to you that that you're not going to get if you completely cut off from that as 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 uh, someone who writes about it. Um, other things I thought were important was. Um, importance of learning from your audience. I think I've learned this from giving talks and some of the feedback I've had about my books, really. I mean, this is an interesting thing I found on the internet, What why is science communication important? It's really it says it's to educate the public, to make informed decisions, that's important, make science more transparent, address urgent issues, inform and educate companies, uh, educate decision makers. It's a bit top down. It's a bit like saying we're going to teach you the public or the policy makers about science. And I think the only problem with this approach is that, of course, scientists themselves can learn from the public. They can learn all sorts of things. And what I've learned from giving talks about consciousness is that that people, maybe it's just a topic that you hope that everyone would have an interest in at some point. Um, I've learned all sorts of things about you know the, the, what other people think about consciousness and how it works. That have helped inform me and helped to develop my writing. Um, so I think that's been, and, and that also applies to children, you know. I mean, you know, actually working with school children, you know, talking about sex reproduction, DNA, it's amazing what sophisticated and interesting ideas even you know, a 10 year old child might have. Um, so I just thought I'd end really by, by saying, I think the other important uh, thing I can say really, if I want to say anything about my experience of, of, of working in this area. Is, is is doing it your own way. You know, everyone's, I think, got a potential to give all sorts of things in life. And certainly, um, the way that you choose to try and develop a career, obviously, is very much individual thing. And, you know, I've just given my perspective on, on how I kind of help. I've tried to develop a kind of parallel career in communication. But of course, the more the technology changes, the more the social media changes, there's probably all sorts of things that I'm not even aware of that might be offer opportunities in the future. Um, so yeah, anybody who's uh, interested in science communication and popularization of science, I'd definitely encourage anyone to, to try it because it's, it's really quite an exciting aspect of, of, of my career. And, uh, as I said, there's a tension there. I could have just purely focused on my research and spoken to the kind of people uh, who were interested in that very specific area. But to some extent, I've had probably more exciting discussions with the general public uh, about, say, issues like consciousness than often I'd have with members of my own department about, you know, the very specifics of cancer sickness, and maybe because the issue is that much broader. Um, so it's certainly, to me, it's been an exciting kind of additional aspect to, to the scientific group. But I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Now I'll go to one to the Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I, the whole question of, of how you write about science for the public, I think is, is interesting in itself, but the kind of language that you use, because, you know, the broader reach that you're going to have is going to be based on trying to explain complex ideas in a fairly simple way, really. And I think there's, I mean, some people, I think far better than I could ever uh, could do, right? it's, they're often very good at using metaphors to explain complex ideas. So there's a whole skill there. And I think certainly writing for the for the Times was useful and it forced me to try and explain complex things in, in, in a simple way. 
Um, actually, in, to some extent, it was probably useful to write about things I knew nothing about, you know, like super volcanoes and um, and I think it's chocolate's addictive, that kind of thing, rather than, you know, stuff I do know about genetics and the genome and, and so on and so forth, because I was coming to it as a non-expert. So I, th I think in a way, writing about any, or, or talking really about any kind of complex subject, it's worth trying to think of it as, as not being an expert, because the worst thing you can do is to use lots of jargon and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's in the skill, skill in itself. Now, whether it's more difficult for a non-native English speaker to talk about these things, um, that's not for me to really know because I've never had to speak about these things in a different language. And it's a real, and I, I admire all my colleagues who you know, uh, multiple, learn can speak multiple languages fluently. Um, I, mean, I would say, I mean, I also am an avid novel reader. Yeah? So one of my favorite novelists, uh, actually two of my favorite novelists, Joseph Conrad, and um, Vladimir Nabokov, one was Russian, one was Polish. That was it, yeah. So, so to me, they, they were brilliant writers in the English language. And now they, they did, it wasn't their native language, but they just had a way with words. And you know, Haruki Murakami uh, actually is another favorite novelist of mine. And he actually started to try and write his novels by Trans writing it first in English and then translating it back into Japanese is kind of weird because it gave him a, a kind of slightly different way of saying things that then he was going to get by his thinking it was a Japanese person. So so actually we may find that all sorts of you know, non-native speakers have all sorts of potential to 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 write in English or talk in English. Of course, there was a huge opening maybe for for you know to speak and write in other languages. I mean, certainly for me. The more possibilities there are for having my books translated into Chinese or, or you know, Hindu or all sorts of languages would, would, would be of interest to me, really. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, actually. But but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be sort of put off by not being in any language at all, really. I think the main thing is to think how can I explain complex ideas in a simple way and and, re and in reaching you know re you almost need to stop thinking like science to do that in a moment. Yeah, even a native speaker with academic they don't inherit this thing of writing from this painting in the way. Is there any like society so you know platform that is for that students can train themselves into popularization of science and not? I mean, I, I don't know what it's like in Estonia, certainly in Oxford, there's there's a whole range of student societies. I mean, I, I haven't mentioned half the kind of forums I've, I've talked to. I mean, I was, in, I was asked to talk at the Biochemical Society, that's a student society. They have a student public, a publication about science. Um, so you, there's usually all sorts of forums. I mean, in, initially, I went, even when I was a PhD student, you know, I used to write for some, um, it was like Social Affairs magazine, I think it was. Uh, it, was, it wasn't a kind of widely normal, but it was it was a useful forum because they were quite keen to have scientists writing for them. Um, so I think you'll find there's all sorts of outlets out there possibly to, that would give you a place to write. Because of course it's not going to be easy to pitch a, a, an article to the Times or the new scientists that kind of thing. But it's surprising how you start to develop those skills that then you can often find possibilities. I mean, for instance, I. I've written some um, pieces on the online for the Psychology Today. That there's there's actually a whole forum, whole series of different forums out there that, that are looking for people to write for them, blogs, that kind of thing. Um, you just got to look around, I think, really. Uh, and I think it's also practice makes perfect, like they say. I mean, I'm sure there's there's a sort of you know like the great artists and you know like you know we're not all going to be a Picasso and Einstein, and, and it's probably true of, of writing. There'll always be some people who've got that kind of gift for for writing. And, and maybe that there's even biological aspects to it. But but what I definitely know is that the more that you write and the more you kind of get used to writing for the public, it, it, it's a skill that develops really. And the same with speaking as well. Isn't it? A question from online participants. Uh, hi, what do you think what kind of support from universities would be most useful in the process? And what has been your biggest mistake that you learned from? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I'll address the first issue first. Um, yeah, I, I think there is a problem in academic science in that, on the one hand, I don't know what it's like in this country, but on the one hand, we're expected to make our work accessible to the public. You know, we, we always, in the grant applications you write in the UK now, we have to do the kind of lay person summary. Um, but I, I think, unfortunately, popular science, there isn't really a, a 
I don't think the adequate recognition of the importance of popular science, at least for some time, is in, in, in the academic structure. So we have a thing called a REF in, in Britain, which is a, a, a measure of, of in, in universities, uh, an institution's output in academic terms. Um, and each individual is, is asked to, you know, supply, uh, each PI is, is asked to supply, um, you know, publications that should go to this REF. And obviously, I, you know, I would try and pick my best, four best scientific publications that I publish in the academic journals. It's supposed to kind of acknowledge things like popular science, but I think in practice it doesn't really. And, and I've, I've met people in my own department who, who said that they, they think popular science is, is, is rubbish and we shouldn't be doing that kind of thing, you know. So, so it's surprising how many attitudes like that still exist in science. Um, so really, I don't think there's enough. I mean, it's not like I think every scientist or every academic should be doing this kind of thing. I think it's for each person to decide what they want to choose to do in their career. And it's not very, it's probably not something that everyone's necessarily good at, you know. You can be a brilliant scientist and probably be absolutely useless at communicating that science to the public. Um, but it would be nice to have a bit more kind of sense of it being an important part of it in an academic career. Having said that, I think the best thing to do, if you realise you've really got a forte for this kind of thing and you like doing it, um, just get on and do it, you know. It's up to you as an individual to decide how much you devote to these things. Of course, if you want to build a scientific career, you've got to be aware of the amount of time that that involves in terms of, you know, writing, you know, writing papers and reviews as well. And as I said, that's a bit of a tension, really, because... I find these days, actually, I'd love to write popular science. I'd probably do it full time in a way, but, but I don't want to do that because I like my research and I like, I like that other side of my career. Um, the question about biggest mistakes, ooh, I mean, it was Frank Sinatra, wasn't it? He said about, I made a few mistakes or whatever he said. Um, of course, there's all sorts of things that I might have done differently. Maybe I would have started even earlier to focus on popular science, you know, rather than getting it relatively late in my career. So if you want to get in there right from the start, maybe it's a good idea. Um, having said that, it might be a useful thing to develop a scientific career first and then start to develop more time to this kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, in a way, my career has kind of progressed in, in both ways that I think, oh, if only I'd done that, I'd done this. So I think in general, it's been, it's been to me, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have done differently. Really. Yeah. John, thank you very much. It was really, really entertaining to sit and listen to you and I think, I think talks like yours and people like you we need more to have it here. Just as a scientist for example you in your own uh, career and in your own topic you are not into psychology as the branch of science that is but you have written now popular books about it uh, so are you not afraid as a scientist you're trained to be accurate to write about facts and present the and that is what we as scientists are somehow very very conscious about but now that you somehow write in a completely different topic as is it not something that worries you that maybe i do mistake and if it, even if it is popular science that somehow that would be then later they will discover this mistake and i will be shamed or so on and so on. is that not a, not a problem is that a, not an um, issue, or is that not something that you would be worried about? Yeah, I mean, definitely, actually, in, in the sense of the more you extend yourself out, you kind of comfort zone. There's no doubt at all that you start thinking, Am I, I know what I'm talking about, that kind of thing. I mean, I think it was interesting that my first book about the genome, in many ways, although I'm, I'm not really a geneticist or a, a genomic specialist, in, I mean, I, I am in the sense, you know, I do genomic analysis in my lab, that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm not someone who's, you know, worked on the human genome or anything like that. So, so that in itself was, I suppose, a departure away from my specific field of calcium signaling and molecular analysis of that. But of course, you know, one reads around, you know, I read lots of, I mean, you could argue that these books, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's a shame they're not acknowledged more in the ref, for instance, that you, you could argue these books are quite scholarly work. You know, I don't know how many references there are in mine, just a thousand and some, something in it. Some of them are, you know, newspaper articles and things like that, but there's a lot of papers in there as well. And I, I think the, the reason I started to then get an interest in, in writing about oh, much more than just genetics and, and genome analysis and gene editing, well, was because I've had an interest in consciousness for years, actually. So I've, I've thought about writing a book about consciousness for, for a long time, really. Um, I think it's because I was particularly inspired 
um, by a, a, a view of the mind. It's, it's this psychologist called Lev Vygotsky who worked in Russia in the 30s, 20s and 30s. So I read about his ideas years ago. I thought, there's something here that could be quite exciting, really. So I thought, well, in some ways, I'm coming into it from a, a specific way of looking at the mind and, and what I was then trying to do in mind shift, and I've done that in my, in my uh, most recent book that comes out in October, was to think, well, that was something that an idea that was developed in the 20s and 30s in the last century. What's changed in terms of neuroscience to kind of back that up? So I felt confident in the sense I had a framework that I felt was quite an original, quite an exciting one. Now, could I, as a biologist, use my kind of knowledge as a scientist and my way of working with science to then try and think, well, how does that fit with what modern neuroscience is showing? Um, there's no doubt at all, I think, that there'll be neuroscientists out there who think, you know, how, how dare, you know, John Farrington write this 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 book about consciousness, I think, you know. Uh, and it's true, actually, that the, the moment I'm, I'm now... Actually, I, I write pretty fast these days. I mean, I've, I've accepted this... Um, this contract, signed this contract to write the book about cognitive science and primary. Yeah? So it's going to cover, I guess, everything from consciousness to new, neuroscience, psychology, and where all in 50,000 words, not a challenge to all of us. Um, and I've written the first 10,000 words. So I kind of, I, I kind of pretty speedy is the variety of things. And, and of course, I will need to back it up with a lot of, it's going to be more rigorous than I think the popular science stuff, because of course, it's got to be um, students who are doing a neuroscience syllabus, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be people out there, if it is popular and it sells well, they'll think, you know, what's, what's John Perry and, you know, writing about this kind of thing, or is not his, his speciality. Um, I suppose my answer would be if it comes to consciousness, it's such a big question that I'm not sure that neuroscientists themselves are necessarily always the best people to write about, because, of course, they may know lots about a specific area of, you know, how the brain works, but not really in terms of the big picture. And I think sometimes... Um, being be not, you know, like I was saying earlier on about working for the Times, being not specialist in the in the topic, almost forces you to really think more carefully about, you know, how are you going to communicate that to the public. Um, ultimately, I think it's it's got to stand up in terms of, you know, um, whether it makes sense in scientific terms. I mean, I certainly made a point of asking, you know, a couple of neuroscientists to read Mindship Dutch, then, and I didn't get any kind of negative feedback about it. So I thought, fine, that seems pretty good. Um, there are things that I've, I've spotted mistakes in my own books, actually. I, think, mm, I, I, I was wrong there, you know, because so it's a learning process in itself. So talking about mistakes, yeah, I mean, you, you realize sometimes I didn't express that properly, or maybe I even it was wrong about that. But that's in a way why I see the book writing this person as, as a kind of continual thing. You know, you finish your last book and you move on, and in a way that the whole point is to try and develop your ideas. And that's the exciting bit, actually. That's the bit that I think interests me as a scientist is that I've actually, I think, learned and developed original ideas in, in, in a bigger forum, in this case, consciousness, that, 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 um, that I might have a chance to do in my own kind of more narrow kind of research work. Um, but yeah, you, you you kind of put your neck on the line a bit. But I mean, and certainly with the TV, TV documentary, I mean, that was a worry after I'd, I'd done that. I was thinking, did I say that? Maybe that was, a, I should have expressed it differently. I, I remember we were talking about the um, a person like Ian Brady and how, how a person like that could somehow do the horrible things that he did. And, and, and also about the difference between maybe thinking something and acting on it. And I think at one point I said, um, you know, of course, we all have dark ideas, we all have dark thoughts, but we don't necessarily go out and act on them. And I said, I think that, and then and I was talking to my wife after and saying, I said this, and she said, well, I don't have any dark thoughts. So I thought, mm -hmm. okay, maybe is it just me? You know, I'm going to come up to some kind of psychopath or something. But anyway, they didn't use that bit in the end. But, but of course, you know, anything you say that I can film then, to some extent, and if you say, obviously talk to a journalist and, and they're looking for a quote, you've got to be careful, obviously, what you say. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know, actually. I, I, I'd love to get more feedback from this latest book from neuroscientists and psychologists. Mind should come out in the middle of the pandemic, so I don't think it quite got the sort of, you know, attention that I would like in terms of, uh, you know, reviews, that kind of thing. And, I, I, you know, I'd love to some neuroscientists to say that, um, wow, that was a really insightful kind of view of how the mind works and it, and it stimulated possibilities in terms of research, you know, because that's ultimately what I'd like to inspire. If someone says, you know, you were wrong on that or you'd got that bit wrong, I have to think mm, I should have been more careful there. But obviously then I would then learn that from that process, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, two some of the same questions. I hope it's okay. Uh, how do you maintain work-life balance? Uh, because obviously you're very busy, and well, yeah, this balance is obviously very important um, to keep playing. And uh, number two, how good are you at uh, saying no? Because uh, there are so many exciting, different exciting opportunities, and if you say yes, sure, then yeah, well, you may regret it afterwards. So is it an innate or acquired skill for you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've learned lots through the process of, of getting more involved in this area. I mean, the, the work-life balance, that's a real challenge. You know, I'm having a bunch of children. Um, to do that, to combine a scientific career, an academic teaching career, writing proper science, taking part in documentaries is, is, a, is a balance act, really. Um, maybe all lives are balancing acts out the two away. I mean, I think at one point I was writing practically every night and my wife pointed out that, you know, then it'd be good if we had a bit more time, you know, to get an evening. So, okay, I'm getting, I'm taking it in here. So, so yeah, so, so I think you do need to be quite um, disciplined with your time. Actually, I, I do try and write every evening at some point, at least something, you know. And it's surprising how once you start to get more of a feel for to write, how you can really can be quite disciplined and produce quite a lot with it. And like I said, once I decide I was going to write this this uh, primer, I've, I've already written ten thousand words. It's almost I think my process. I think every writer's got their own ways of doing things. What I found that works for me is that if I just write without having any you know no notes or really trying to really think too much about the detail uh, of of everything. And just write the text. I, I feel it just seems to often flow. And, and so what I tend to do, and that's kind of what I'm aiming for with this this new the primer thing. Um, I write the fifty thousand words as a sort of first draft, and then I'll then start to come back and, and work on the detail and check, you know, check things. Did I was that correct? What I just said, that kind of thing. Um, so I think you've got it, it, it can your efficiency can increase, yeah. I mean, certainly in terms of my academic career, there's, there's definitely a tension there in the sense that um, if it's a choice of writing a popular science book and proposal or writing a, a grant proposal, I think these days I'd probably find the, the popular science book proposal easier, really, uh, or at least more interesting, to I say. Um, but of course, it's part of my job is to bring in funds and, and, and do, you know, do research. So that, that is a challenge. Yeah. And may, maybe, the, you know, maybe that's one reason why Although I said one maybe regret I have that is that I didn't get into popular science earlier. Maybe it makes sense to develop that scientific career first, you know, on a shorter footing, and then of course, you know, you've got PhD students and postdocs kind of working for you. And then you may have more time to do, you know, like the, I did the creative writing and, and the um, science communication courses when I already had my own lab. So it just makes sense how I, I could kind of take a bit of time off to do that. Um, on the other hand, it would be a shame to keep putting it off. You know, I've, I've met people who have said, yeah, I'd love to write a proper science book. And, and, but, but then if they're never going to get around to doing it, then of course they could keep saying it. So, so I think at some point you've got to bite the bullet and say, uh, you know, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it sooner rather than later. Right? Does that answer everything you asked? I can't remember if there's another. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. But uh, say no. No, so say no, yeah. Well, well I think that's where the kind of discipline comes in because, because of course you've got to regiment your time and, and decide how much you're going to devote to I think in general though it's not it's not a good idea to say no. You know if someone asks you to give a talk, you know, whether it's cafe sit time to or you know Oxford Literary Festival, whatever, I tend to say fine, yeah, good. It's it's a good way of publicizing my books, but it's also a good way of getting feedback and, and actually learning from it really doing work at the school. I mean, I'm not going to get anything, you know, money for this or anything like that. It's not going to build my career in that sense. But it was great fun and and uh, and I enjoyed doing it. And and it was actually quite um actually I did write I mean when I was looking at Times, at the time we had a an education minister that was saying that we should get rid of practicals in in, in school class science classes. Because it was taking up much too much time, and it should be just textbook learning. And Michael Gove has got—he's still around, actually. He's still in the in the government somewhere. Else. Um, and and I managed, even though the Times is quite a conservative newspaper, I still managed to use the forum to write a column attacking Michael Gove in a kind of fairly veiled way and saying that 
actually I thought practical science was the best way to teach children about science and it was and I even use this phrase science is wicked and uh, which I just learned from doing this kind of classroom activity so in some ways it was interesting how that experience working in a school classroom fed into the journalism that I was doing at the time so yeah I think in general try not to turn down opportunities and, and also be willing to work out say comfort so I, I thought when I was asked you know to do a documentary on um a serial killer, you know, not really my first choice of my first entry into TV work, really, you know. But uh, but I thought I'll, I'll try and see what it's like, and it was and it was interesting, you know. I've, I've had colleagues that have said, "Well, I would never do that because you know, what if you come up and you know, people think you're flaky or you know, you're not serious about science." I don't know. So so in general, I think it's worth trying to step outside the comfort zone and and and, and try something new. It's surprising what you can learn and, and actually find yourself really enjoying as well. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
and there are some people who are not into science at all, and there are some people who really understand science. And uh, when communicating, how to find the balance so that it would be interesting and understandable for people who don't really know anything about science, and at the same time, it wouldn't be too boring and simple for people who are really into science. And uh, my second question is that often when scientists are communicating uh, what they are doing in their research, then for them it seems very simple and obvious for the general audience to have no idea what they're talking about. They are using words and terms that for them are like simple, obvious, they know all about it, but uh, they don't even think about the fact that it's not that obvious for people who are not in their sense. Yeah, yeah, very interesting um, points raised there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think in terms of kind of making science accessible to the public, yeah, of course, there are different audiences. If I give a talk at, you know, the Oxford Literary Festival, I will have a set of people who, um, in general, you know, they'll be quite well read and they'll come along with this thing because they're interested in reading and that kind of thing. Having said that, you know, I, I heard that there was a couple, I, I was a bit worried about my talk um, uh, at the Oxford Literature Festival earlier this year because the book actually came out in 2021 and, and so it was a year after it had come out and I thought, is anybody going to turn up? That kind of, in the end, it was a full room and it was great. There was a lot of people there and I'd, I'd heard that somebody said they'd heard one of the couples who was sitting next to them because so a few friends of mine kind of came along. Uh, they said, oh, they, they were talking about how they'd been wondering which talk to go to and they thought, well, this sounds, it might not be my thing, but I'll, I'll give it a go, you know. So of course you might get people in there who know nothing about the topic and you should be willing to be able to make your talk broad enough and accessible enough that you're going to bring those kind of people in. Um, I think there are different forums for, for talking about to the public. So, so clearly, you know, if I um, if I write a popular science book with OUP, I, I know there's only going to be a, a, a more limited audience are going to maybe go and buy that book, maybe because they think it's too, you know, anybody else might think it's too technical, I'm not into reading books, that kind of thing. Um, in a way, that's why I thought it was interesting to try and write for a different publisher. I can put books are much more aimed at um, kind of mass market. We will see how that makes a difference in terms of how the book consciousness of the book sells. Certainly, I've tried to write it in a much more, I mean, it's a shorter book for a start, much less referencing specific scientists. I, I, in my first book, there was a lot of, in my first few books, I think there was a lot of referencing specific studies by specific scientists, naming them when the institution they're in. And, and after a while, I realized it was maybe making it too technical, too detailed. So in the, in the last book, it's been a lot more trying to make it chattier and also not making it as technical. But yet at the same time, trying to explain really complex ideas, which was the challenge, actually. Actually, coming back to what you were saying earlier on, it was about, about the how you make sure you're not going to get things wrong in a subject that you know nothing about. I mean, one of the things I've really got excited about in my new book about consciousness is new findings that I think are really quite pathbreaking in neuroscience. And it's interesting because a lot of people in my department don't seem to have heard of them, even though they're, they're like our neuroscience. But it's a science that MIT called Earl Miller, and he's been using, uh, he's been doing studies on, on primates to, um, to try and understand how brainwaves of different frequencies um, regulate connections between different parts of the brain. And, and it's a very complex subject, but I think it, it kind of frames our view of how, how the mind works and how the brain works. And so I got quite excited about this. And I didn't, I didn't mention it in my first book uh, about conscious mind shift, but I was a bit worried that I'd not really understood it properly. Uh, and, and so I went back and, and so I actually wrote to this guy and emailed him and said, you know, do you mind if I interview you? And, and I don't actually quote him at all in the book because, again, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to overdo that kind of quoting of science and the rest of it. But I, you know, I, he was very kind and gave me an hour of his time and I listened to him and I taped it all and read it, kind of played it back. And I think I've got a pretty good grasp of what, he, what he's saying and what he's doing. So, so being able to sort of reach out to those experts, you know, of course he could have just said, no, I haven't got time to talk to you, but it helped that I'd already written a book about consciousness. So, so I think you can you can use those kind of experts to some extent if you really think I'm not quite sure about this. Um, but yeah, so there are different forums, and I, I guess in my writing I'm kind of developing that. You know, I'm progressing in some ways to try and write a more kind of popular thing. I mean, the documentary. I'm I'm hoping that there's you know there's a, a set of people out there. By the by the way, when I first started to research um, Ian Brady and the Mars murders. 
as the gold. I realized that there's, I thought when I listened to a couple of other documentaries that have been made in the past about this topic, I never realized just how many of these things are out there on the internet. I mean, Amazon Prime and Netflix, it is full of the whole, you know, loads and loads of these true crime stuff. Yeah, it's a bit worrying in some ways because I'm so fascinated by all this stuff, really. Um, and, um, and and of course, there'll be a, a set of people out there who love true crime. You know, they might not be interested in science per se, but they'll be interested in, you know, mass murder and that kind of thing. It would be nice to think that what I said in there about the mind and, and the nature versus nurture and all these things might have had an impact on those people in the way they think about the world, even though they may have gone in there, specifically because they're interested in, you know, mass murders and that kind of thing. So so I think there's always the possibility to find a new audience by doing things, by, you know, like I said, go outside your comfort zone and, and, and be willing to try new new ways of, of, of uh, talking to the public, really. And you may find there's a whole set of new audiences out there that, that you can influence. Um, does that make, does that answer everything? Mm, yeah, kind of. But I'm still thinking about, like, how do you know that what you say is understandable for everyone and not just? Because yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, actually, it was interesting. I, I, I mentioned the talk I gave at the Oxford Literary Festival. And, and actually, one of my problems that I have when I've got a, a whole room full of people and they're all looking at is, is uh, I don't know, despite the fact I'm very interested in um, consciousness, I often don't always read people's, you know, faces and body language list of it. And so all I could see at one point in the talk was, as I was talking, was was just to see if faces all looking at me and they're thinking, that, am I making sense? You know, is any of this making sense? And this was all going through my head as I was talking about this. Uh, and then it, it, as it turned out at the end, as soon as I'd finished talking and the questions started coming, there was a whole range of questions. There, there was a massive number of questions. There were some really good questions. In general, the debate was, I thought was really interesting. So I guess at that point, I realised, well, I must have connected to the extent that people are really interested to ask all these questions and things like that. So, so I think it's like the things I said earlier on, it, it's, it's a sort of developing skill, isn't it? I mean, I have no idea how I communicate today and, and how it's come over, but, you know, you'd hope that as you get more used to talking to the public that, or even to your fellow academics, you get better at it and you get better at actually responding to those questions and things like that, really. I think one thing that's important when talking about something like consciousness, as opposed to my research on two four channels and their role in, in disease, health and disease, is there's not necessarily the right answers. You know, I mean, actually, with the two four channels, I mean, of course, there are lots of different ways of interpreting our data, but it's a more narrow focus, it's a more specific thing. Consciousness, well, of course, there's all sorts of different possibilities that are out there. And because it's probably one of the biggest unsolved problems in science, we, we don't know half of what we, we might know in you know, 10, 20, 50 years' time or whatever. So there's always the possibility that someone asks a question that, well, you, you can't really answer it. You, know, you, you can try and answer it. But, and so I think it's important to be willing to well, be aware that you can only give a point of view, really, you know, that you are, you're an expert in the sense of giving that talk about consciousness to an audience and you've written a book about it. But, but you know, it's, it's a point of view and, and you're willing to be, to listen to what the audience have got to say as well, really. Uh, it's got to be a dialogue, I think. That's, and, and of course, the more of a dialogue it is, the better I think the science communication is working rather than, you know, as I was saying in one of the last slides, it shouldn't be just a top down, I'm talking to you, I'm telling you what the, what the situation is. Other. Just a very, very practical question and advice to all of us if you want to write our first popular site, we would like you to really with your knowledge now. What could we do? Should we at first write the whole book and then go to find a publisher for it? Or no, should we just at first try to find a publisher and then making a contract or so and then, then try to start to write the book? Also? Actually, I think in my own experience, I think it shows how these sort of chance connections can help because, you know, I, I've done this 10 of the times. I thought because of the, the article we published on um, the Jeetle and the Enco book, I thought there might be a book there, you know. And, and it's interesting that as someone else wrote a, a similar book called Junk DNA pretty much at the same time. So it wasn't just like me that had thought this. Um, but of course, I still had to find where I could publish this book. So, so what, I, what actually happened was I was having lunch at college. And one of the good things about Oxford College is that 
you know, you end up sitting next to a historian or a lawyer, or and in this case, I was sat next to a, a colleague who's, who's a, a geologist, and he just um, published a book with Oxford University Press um, about, it was partly about kind of a popular science book about geology and mountains and things, but it was also a bit about his background as a mountain climber, and, and I think he, it kind of came together in that sense. And he mentioned this, and, and he said, "Oh well, I, and I work with this publisher at OUP, and, and, and it turned out he was actually a friend of hers, so that probably helped a bit in getting published." And so he put me in touch with her, and, and I just wrote to her and said, "Look, you know, I've, I've I've written for the. I think it helped the fact I'd written for the Times, because of course I usually they asked me to sort of supply some, you know, a sample chapter that kind of thing. I didn't really need to do that because, of course, I, I'd showed I could already write popular science for the Times and things, even though journalism and books are obviously a bit different." So without a doubt, that was a way into the, to the, the, the profession. But, you know, the, the OUP is willing to have unsolicited manuscripts. People, they should have got a very specific procedure. Uh, you have a proposal. I, I need to send you that proposal, actually, I've got for the, the Digger Genome. Um, you have a proposal, and you, you do, like, uh, the different chapters. You summarise, you know, each chapter, paragraph each chapter. You've usually got an intro, a bit of biography about yourself. You send that along. They have a very specific reviewing process. They have, like, you know, different people look at this and then send feedback. And if they like it, it then goes to the board and then they, they decide whether they want a commission or not. And I think the deal is they give you, I don't know what the, the money is now, give you £2,000 for signing contracts and then they give you another £2,000 if you then when you then finish the book. So there's a certain incentive to you know to finish it. You get the extra two k by doing that. Um, yeah, that that was probably the best way in because of course at that point, without an agent, without any experience in writing books, it might have been difficult to have just got a, a, a more commercial publisher to accept uh, the manuscript. So yeah, so if you're interested, I would have said LUP is definitely a, a place to, to go for actually. Um, and they're a bit more on the more technical, more kind of. Um, detailed side of popular science so it might be also a useful start because you know when i look back at my lap, my first book i can see all sorts of from a mistake i can see all sorts of things i could have done differently or maybe it was a bit too technical and that kind of thing so yeah we, we evolve as we write i think um but i think one of the most important things though is to just get in if you really want to do it if you think you've got a good idea just get on with it you know write a proposal you know even Write your sample chapter that'll give you a sense of how difficult or not it can be to write popular science because I, it's certainly not you know i've, I've science said to me oh, yeah i'd love to write popular science but it, it's, it's such a different thing from writing an academic paper that you've got to really see whether you know how, how easy it is for you and um i can help with that it shows there is a route in there for anyone really yeah yeah mm -hmm. And then one last for me. Yeah. Uh, what could be your advice to young scientists uh, to connect their love science to popular science? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. As I said, one thing that really struck me doing the science communication course was how many of the people seemed to want to get out of science. Maybe they were a bit disillusioned with the whole, you know, PhD, postdoc, trying to get your own lab kind of thing. And, and, and fine. I mean, I think, you know, that, that's fine if that's what you want to do. I don't think there are enough people who actually are still working in science who write popular science. And I'd, I'd love to think that we could we can combine the two. And certainly I think I've, I've done that to sort of very degree of success. Um, so on the one hand, really build your scientific career, go all out to really do exciting research and you know build a scientific career in that sense. But if it's something of interest to you, try and find a way to get into it. Maybe not you know, necessarily writing a book, if, if that seems a lot too much to do, but try and find a way to develop those skills as early as you can, really, whether it's writing for a student publication or giving a talk at the student society. And, and you never know what your fault you might be. You know, you may turn out you're a, a TikTok genius who can you know, reach millions or something. You know, there's also many different forums available these days in particular you know something i am probably not the best person to ask about you know what what social media forums are are out there that you could develop really because of course you know there's always been this debate ever since the internet uh, came about really that you know it, a book's on the way out i'd like to think not because you know I, I like writing books and i like trying to sell them um but it's clear that, there, that there's been an evolution in what uh, what people how we get the information so you know, maybe there's a huge market out there for um, I mean, I say commercially viable because, I mean, personally, I, I, I like to think that whatever I do, 
his respect, you know, and he's got some sense of, you know, gets him back from it. Not necessarily that has to be a monetary thing, but, you know, if you can sell your wares to the public, then why not? You know, if you can make money out of this, which is always used to have a bit of extra money, uh, you know, try and find ways to monetize what you do with really. it. Because, uh, of course, you can always use that money in then interesting ways to develop your career or post or whatever. Um, so things I don't really know about in terms of how you can monetize, you know, talks and things like that. But, um, but yeah, probably get on with it sooner rather than later. But it would be nice to think that you don't need to give up incentive career to do that. You, know, you can combine the two. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 So I invite the audience to hand over to Let's go over there. Just the background is nice. Yeah, yeah, I like that too. Need my way. Thank you. Good. Thank you. 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 Th